Hello, thank you for joining me today. We're reading through A Course in Miracles, the, the main text, and today we are on chapter 17, Forgiveness and the Holy Relationship. Section one, bringing fantasy to truth. The betrayal of the Son of God lies only in illusions and all his sins are but his own imagining. His reality is forever sinless. He need not be forgiven, but awakened. In his dreams, he has betrayed himself, his brothers, and his God. Yet what is done in dreams has not been really done. It is impossible to convince the dreamer that this is so, for dreams are what they are because of their illusion of reality. Only in waking is the full release for, from them, for only then does it become perfectly apparent that they had no effect upon reality at all and did not change it. Fantasies change reality. That is their purpose. They cannot do so in reality, but they can do so in the mind that would have reality be different. It is then only your wish to change reality that is fearful, because by your wish you think you have accomplished what you wish. This strange position, in a sense, acknowledges your power. Yet by distorting it and devoting it to evil, it also makes it unreal. You cannot be faithful to two masters who ask conflicting things of you. What you use in fantasy, you deny to truth. Yet what you give to truth to use for you is safe from fantasy. When you maintain that there must be an order of difficulty in all miracles, all you mean is that there are some things you would withhold from truth. You believe truth cannot be real. I'm sorry, you believe truth cannot deal with them only because you would keep them from truth. Very simply, your lack of faith in the power that heals all pain arises from your wish to retain some aspects of reality for fantasy. If you but realized what this must do to your appreciation of the whole, what you reserve for yourself, you take away from him who would release you. Unless you give it back, it is inevitable that your perspective on reality be warped and uncorrected. As long as you would have it so, so long will the illusion of an order of difficulty in miracles remain with you. For you have established this order in reality by giving some of it to one teacher and some to another. And so you learn to deal with part of the truth in one way, and in another way, the other part. To fragment truth is to destroy it by rendering it meaningless. Orders of reality is a perspective without understanding, a frame of reference for reality to which it cannot really be compared at all. Think you that you can bring truth to fantasy and learn what truth means from the perspective of illusions? Truth has no meaning in illusion. The frame of reference for its meaning must be itself. When you try to bring truth to illusions, you are trying to make illusions real and keep them by justifying your belief in them. But to give illusions to truth is to enable truth to teach that illusions are unreal and thus enable you to escape from them. Reserve not one idea aside from truth, or you establish orders of reality that must imprison you. There is no order in reality because everything there is true. Be willing then to give all you have held outside the truth to him who knows the truth, and in whom all is brought to truth. Be not concerned with anything, anything except your willingness to have this be accomplished. He will accomplish it, not you. But forget not this. 
When you become disturbed and lose your peace of mind because another is tempting to solve his problems through fantasy, you are refusing to forgive yourself for just this same attempt. And you are holding both of you away from truth and from salvation. As you forgive him, you restore to truth what was denied by both of you, and you will see forgiveness where you have given it. That's the end of section one. Chapter 17, Forgiveness and the Holy Relationship, Section 2, The Forgiven World. Can you imagine how beautiful those you forgive will look to you? In no fantasy have you ever seen anything so lovely. Nothing you see here, sleeping or waking, comes near to such loveliness. And nothing will you value like unto this, nor hold so dear. Nothing that you remember that, you, that made your heart sing with joy has ever brought you even a little part of happiness this sight will bring you. For you will see the Son of God. You will behold the beauty the Holy Spirit loves to look upon, and which he thanks the Father for. He was created to see this for you until you learned to see it for yourself. And all his teaching leads to seeing it and giving thanks with him. This loveliness is not a fantasy. It is the real world, bright and clean and new, with everything sparkling under the open sun. Nothing is hidden here, for everything has been forgiven, and there are no fantasies to hide the truth. The bridge between that world and this is so little and so easy to cross that you could not believe it is the meeting place of worlds so different. Yet this little bridge is the strongest thing that touches in on all the Sorry, let's try that again. Yet this little bridge is the strongest thing that touches on this world at all. This little step so small it has escaped your notice, is a stride through time into eternity, beyond all ugliness, into beauty that will enchant you and will never cease to cause you wonderment at its perfection. This step, the smallest ever taken, is still the greatest accomplishment in God's plan of atonement. All else is learned, but this is given complete and wholly perfect. No one but him who planned salvation could complete it thus. The real world in its loveliness you learn to reach. Fantasies are all undone, and no one and nothing remains still bound by them, and by your own forgiveness you are free to see. Yet what you see is only what you made, with the blessing of your forgiveness on it. And with this final blessing of God's Son upon himself, the real perception born of the new perspective he has learned has served its purpose. The stars will disappear in light and the sun that opened up the world to beauty will vanish. Perception will be meaningless when it has been perfected. For everything that has been used for learning will have no function. Nothing will ever change, no shifts or shadings or differences, no variations that made perception possible will still occur. The perception of the real world will be so short that you will barely have time to thank God for it. For God will take the last step swiftly when you have reached the real world and have been made ready for him. The real world is attained simply by the complete forgiveness of the old, the world you see without forgiveness. The great transformer of perception will undertake with you the careful searching of the mind that made this world and uncover to you the seeming reasons for you making it. In the light of the real reason that he brings, as you follow him, 
he will show you that there is no reason here at all. Each spot his reason touches grows alive with beauty. And what seemed ugly in the darkness of your lack of reason is suddenly released to loveliness. Not even what the Son of God made in insanity could be without a hidden spark of beauty that gentleness could release. All this beauty will rise to bless your sight as you look upon the world with forgiving eyes. For forgiveness literally transforms vision and lets you see the real world reaching quietly and gently across the chaos, removing all illusions that had united your perception and fixed it on the past. The smallest leaf becomes a thing of wonder and a blade of grass within God's perfection. From the given world, the Son of God, I'm sorry, from the forgiven world, the Son of God is lifted easily into his home. And there he knows that he has always rested there in peace. Even salvation will become a dream and vanish from his mind, for salvation is the end of dreams, and with the closing of the dream will have no meaning. Who, awake in heaven, could dream that there could ever be need of salvation? How much do you want salvation? It will give you the real world, trembling with readiness to be given you. The eagerness of the Holy Spirit to give you this is so intense, he would not wait, although he waits in patience. Meet his patience with your impatience at delay in meeting him. Go out in gladness to meet your Redeemer and walk with him in trust out of this world and into the real world of beauty and forgiveness. Chapter 17, Forgiveness and the Holy Relationship, Section 3, The Shadows of the Past. To forgive is merely to remember only the loving thoughts you gave in the past and those that were given you. All the rest must be forgiven. Forgotten, rather. All the rest must be forgotten. Forgiveness is a selective remembering, based not on your selection. For the shadow figures you would make immortal are enemies of reality. Be willing to forgive the Son of God for what he did not do. The shadow figures are the witnesses you bring with you to demonstrate he did what he did not. Because you bring them, you will hear them, and you will keep them by your own selection. And I'm sorry, and you who keep them by your own selection do not understand how they came into your mind and what their purpose is. They represent the evil that you think was done to you. You bring them with you only that you may retain evil for evil, hoping that their witness will enable you to think guiltily of another and not harm yourself. They speak so clearly for the separation that no one not obsessed with keeping separation would hear them. They offer you the reasons why you should enter into unholy alliances to support the ego's goals and make your relationships the witness to its power. It is the shadow figures that would make the ego holy in your sight and teach you what you do to keep it safe is really love. The shadow figures always speak for vengeance and all relationships into which they enter are totally insane. Without exception, these relationships have their purpose, the exclusion of the truth about the other and of yourself. This is why you see in both what is not there and make of both the slaves of vengeance. And why whatever reminds you of your past grievances attracts you and seems to go by the name of love, no matter how distorted the associations by which you arrive at the connection may be. And finally, why all such relationships 
become attempts at union through the body, for only bodies can be seen as means for vengeance. That bodies are central to all unholy relationships is evident. Your own experience has taught you this. But what you may not realize are all the reasons that go to make the relationship unholy. For unholiness seeks to reinforce itself, as holiness does, by gathering to itself what it perceives as it, like itself. In the unholy relationship, it is not the body of the other which union is attempted, but the bodies of those who are not there. For even the body of the other, already a severely limited perception of him, is not the central focus as it is, or in entirety. What can be used for fantasies of vengeance, and what can be most readily associated with those on whom vengeance is really sought, is centered on and separated off as being the only parts of value. Each step taken in the making, the maintaining and the breaking off of the unholy relationship is a move toward further fragmentation and unreality. The shadow figures enter more and more, and the one in whom they seem to be, be decreases in importance. Time is indeed unkind to the unholy relationship. For time is cruel in the ego's hands, as it is kind when used for gentleness. The attraction of the unholy relationship begins to fade and to be questioned almost at once. Once it is formed, doubt must enter in because its purpose is impossible. The ideal of the unholy relationship thus becomes one in which the reality of the other does not enter at all to spoil the dream. And the less the other really brings to the relationship, the better it becomes. Thus, the attempt at union becomes a way of excluding even the one with whom the union was sought. For it was formed to get him out of it, and join with fantasies in uninterrupted bliss. How can the Holy Spirit bring his interpretation of the body as a means of communication into relationships whose only purpose is separation from reality? What forgiveness is enables him to do so. If all but loving thoughts have been forgiven, what remains is eternal and the transformed past is made like the present. No longer does the past conflict with now. This continuity extends the present by increasing its reality and its value in your perception of it. In these loving thoughts is the spark of beauty hidden in the ugliness of the unholy relationship where hatred is remembered. Yet there is time to come alive as the relationship is given to him who testifies, I'm sorry, who, it is given to him who gives it life and beauty. That is why atonement centers on the past, which is the source of separation and where it must be undone. For separation must be corrected where it was made. The ego seeks to resolve its problems not at their source, but where they were not made. And thus it seeks to guarantee there will be no solution. The Holy Spirit only wants to make his resolutions complete and perfect. And so he seeks and finds the source of problems where it is and there undoes it. And with each step in his undoing is the separation more and more undone and union brought closer. He is not all confused by any reasons for separation. All he perceives in separation is that it must be undone. Let him uncover the hidden spark of beauty in your relationships and show it to you. Its loveliness will so attract you that you will be unwilling to ever lose the sight of it again. 
and you will let this spark transform the relationship so you can see it more and more. For you will want it more and more and become increasingly unwilling to let it be hidden from you. And you will learn to seek for and establish the conditions in which this beauty can be seen. All this you will do gladly if you but let him hold a spark before you to light your way and make it clear to you. God's Son is one. Whom God has joined as one, the ego cannot put asunder. The spark of holiness must be safe, however hidden it may be, in every relationship. For the creator of the one relationship has left no part of it without himself. This is the only part of the relationship the Holy Spirit sees, because he knows that only this is true. You have made the relationship unreal and therefore unholy by seeing it where it is not and as it is not. Give the past to him who can change your mind about it for you. But first, be sure you fully realize what you have made the past to represent and why. The past becomes the justification for entering into a continuing unholy alliance with the ego against the present. For the present is forgiveness. Therefore, the relationships the unholy alliance dictates are not perceived nor felt as now. Yet the frame of reference to which the present is referred for meaning is an illusion of the past, in which those elements that fit the purpose of the unholy alliance are retained, and all the rest let go. And what is thus let go is all the truth the past could ever offer to the present as witness for its reality. What is kept but witnesses to the reality of dreams. It is still up to you to choose to join with truth or with illusion. But remember that to choose one is to let the other go. Which one you choose, you will endow with beauty and reality because the choice depends on which you value more. The spark of beauty or the, evil, or the veil of ugliness the real world or the world of guilt and fear, truth or illusion, freedom or slavery. It is all the same. For you can never choose except between God and the ego. Thought systems are but true or false, and all their attributes come simply from what they are. Only the thoughts of God are true and all that follows from them comes from what they are and is as true as the holy source from which they came. My holy brother, I would enter into all your relationships and step between you and your fantasies. Let my relationship to you be real to you and let me bring reality to your perception of your brothers. They were not created to enable you to hurt yourself through them. They were created to create with you. This is the truth that I would interpose between you and your goal of madness. Be not separate from me, and let not the holy purpose of atonement be lost to you in dreams of vengeance. Relationships in which such dreams are cherished have excluded me. Let me enter the name of God and bring you peace that you may offer peace to me. Before we go on, there was just this one sentence that I really wanted to dig into for a second. Oh, all right, hang on. I'm going to pause this for a second till I find it. Okay, here it is. Uh, for you can never choose between God and the ego. So um, I just want to talk for a second about this because it's, it's, it's really uh, pointing out 
the difference between the physical housing and your spirit and soul. So your physical housing is being ruled by your ego and it becomes a conscious choice. It has to become a conscious choice to operate your housing from your place of spirit and soul. So I just thought that was a great uh, little sentence there to, to dig in on. And looking at the time, we can certainly uh, read some more. So I'll continue with um, chapter 17, Forgiveness and the Holy Relationship, section four, the two pictures. God established his relationship with you to make you happy, and nothing you do that does not share his purpose can be real. The purpose of God ascribed to anything is its only function. Because of his reason for creating his relationship with you, the function of relationships became forever to make happy. Nothing else. To fulfill this function, you relate to your creations as God to his. For nothing God created is apart from happiness, and nothing God created but would extend happiness as its creator did. Whatever does not fill this function, fulfill this function cannot be real. In this world, it is impossible to create, yet it is possible to make happy. I have said repeatedly that the Holy Spirit would not deprive you of your special relationships, but would transform them. All that is meant by that is that he will restore to them the function given them by God. The function you have given them is clearly not to make happy. But the holy relationship shares God's purpose rather than aiming to make a substitute for it. Every special relationship that you have made is a substitute for God's will and glorifies yours instead of his because of the illusion that they are different. You have made very real relationships even in this world, yet you do not recognize them because you have raised their substitutes to such predominance that when truth calls to you as it does constantly, you answer with a substitute. Every special relationship that you have made has, as its fundamental purpose, the aim of occupying your mind so completely that you will not hear the call of truth. In a sense, the special relationship was the ego's answer to the creation of the Holy Spirit, who was God's answer to the separation. For although the ego did not understand what had been created, it was aware of threat. The whole defense system the ego involved to protect, um, evolved to protect the separation from the Holy Spirit was in response to the gift with which God blessed it and by his blessing enabled it to be healed. This blessing holds within itself the truth about everything. And the truth is that the Holy Spirit is in close relationship with you because in him is your relationship with God restored to you. The relationship with him has never been broken because the Holy Spirit has not been separate from anyone since the separation. And through him have all your holy relationships been carefully preserved to serve God's purpose for you. The ego is alert to threat, and the part of your mind into which the ego was accepted is very anxious to preserve its reason as it sees it. It does not realize that it is totally insane. And you must realize just what this means if you would be restored to sanity. The insane protect their thought systems, but they do so insanely. And all their defenses are as insane as what they are supposed to protect. The separation has nothing in it, no part, no reason, no attribute that is not insane. And its protection is part of it, as insane as the whole. 
the special relationship which is its chief defense must therefore be insane. You have but little difficulty now in realizing that the thought system the special relationship protects is but a system of delusions. You recognize, at least in general terms, that the ego is insane, yet the special relationship still seems to you somehow to be different. Yet we have looked at it far closer than we have at many other aspects of the ego's thought system that you have been willing to let go. While this one remains, you will not let the others go, for this one is not different. Retain this one and you have retained the whole. It is essential to realize that all defenses do what they would defend. The underlying basis for their effectiveness is that they offer what they defend. What they defend is placed in them for safekeeping, and as they operate, they will bring it to you. Every defense operates by giving gifts, and the gift is always a miniature of the thought system the defense protects, set in a golden frame. The frame is very elaborate, all set with jewels and deeply carved and polished. Its purpose is to be of value in itself, to divert your attention from what it, does, what it encloses. But the frame without the picture you cannot have. Defense, defenses operate to make you think you can. The special relationship has the most imposing and deceptive frame of all the defenses the ego uses. Its thought system is offered here, surrounded by a frame so heavy and so elaborate that the picture is almost obliterated by its imposing structure. Into the frame are woven all sorts of fanciful and fragmented illusions of love, set with dreams of sacrifice and self-aggrandizement, and interlaced with gilded threads of self-destruction. The glitter of blood shines like rubies, and the tears of faceted, and the tears are faceted like diamonds and gleam in the dim light in which the offering is made. Look at the picture. Do not let the frame distract you. This gift is given you for your domination, and if you take it, you will believe that you are damned. You cannot have the frame without the picture. What you value is the frame, for there you see no conflict. Yet the frame is only the wrapping for the gift of conflict. The frame is not the gift. Be not deceived by the most superficial aspects of this thought system, for these aspects enclose the whole, complete in every aspect. Death lies in this glittering gift, let not your gaze dwell on the hyponic gleaming of the frame, hyp hypnotic rather, the hypnotic gleaming of the frame. Look at the picture and realize that death is offered you. That is why the holy instant is so important in the defense of truth. The truth itself needs no defense, but you do need defense against your acceptance of the gift of death. When you who are truth accept an idea so dangerous to truth, you threaten truth with destruction, and your defense must now be undertaken to keep the truth whole. The power of heaven, the love of God, the tears of Christ, and the joy of his eternal spirit are marshaled to defend you from your own attack. For you attack them, being part of them, and they must save you, for they love themselves. The holy instant is a miniature of heaven, sent you from heaven. It is a picture, too, set in a frame. Yet if you accept this gift, you will not see the frame at all, because the gift can only be accepted through your willingness to focus all your attention on the picture. The holy instant is a miniature of eternity. It is a picture of timelessness, set in a frame of time. 
If you focus on the picture, you will realize that it is only the frame that made you think it was a picture. Without the frame, the picture is seen as what it represents. For as the whole thought system of the ego lies in its gifts, so the whole of heaven lies in this instant, borrowed from eternity and set in time for you. Two gifts are offered you. Each is complete and cannot be partially accepted. Each is a picture of all that you can have seen very differently. You cannot compare their value by comparing a picture to a frame. It must be the pictures only that you compare, or the comparison is only is wholly without meaning. Remember that it is the picture that is the gift, and only on this basis are you really free to choose. Look at the pictures, both of them. One is a tiny picture, hard to see at all beneath the heavy shadows of its enormous and disproportionate enclosure. The other is lightly framed and hung in tight, lovely to look upon for what it is. You who have tried so hard and are still trying to fit the better picture into the wrong frame and so combine what cannot be combined, accept this and be glad. These pictures are each framed perfectly for what they represent. One is framed to be out of focus and not seen. The other is framed for perfect clarity. The picture of darkness and of death grows less convincing as you search it out among, amid its wrappings. As each senseless stone that seems to shine from the frame in darkness is exposed to light, it becomes dull and lifeless and ceases to distract you from the picture. And finally, you look upon the picture itself, seeing at last that unprotected by the frame, it has no meaning. The other picture is lightly framed, for time cannot contain eternity. There is no distraction here. The picture of heaven and eternity grows more convincing as you look at it. And now, by real comparison, a transformation of both pictures can at last occur. And each is given its rightful place when both are seen in relation to each other. The dark picture brought to light is not perceived as fearful, but the fact that it is just a picture is brought home at last. And what you see there you will recognize as what it is, a picture of what you thought was real and nothing more. For beyond this picture, you will see nothing. The picture of light in clear-cut and unmistakable contrast is transformed into what lies beyond the picture. As you look on this, you realize that it is not a picture, but a reality. This is no figured representation of a thought system, but the thought itself. What, rep what it represents is there. The frame fades gently, and God rises to your resemblance, offering you the whole of creation in exchange for your little picture, wholly without value and entirely deprived of meaning. As God ascends into his rightful place and you to yours, you will experience again the meaning of relationship and know it to be true. Let us ascend in peace together to the Father by giving him ascendance in our minds. We will gain everything by giving him the power and the glory and keeping no illusions of what they are. They are in us through his ascendance. What he has given is his. It shines in every part of him as in the whole. The whole reality of your relationship within lies in our relationship to one another. The holy instant shines alike on all relationships, for in it they are one. For here is only healing, already complete and perfect. For here is God, and where he is, only the perfect and complete 
can be. So I think I will um, pause here and save the rest of this chapter, sections five through, through eight, uh, for the next uh, Sunday's reading. And um, let me just see if I can say a few things to help clarify uh, this, this reading so far. So you're not your housing, right? You're a spirit, you're a soul inhabiting housing, your body. And that is the home of your ego, and it is the function of your body. The ego is a function of your body. And so that's where this dichotomy comes from and this separation um, and the confusion about what's real. So I hope that helps. Um, if you need me, feel free to reach out to me, 907-351-3003, uh, text or call. I don't carry that phone with me constantly, so you might not get me immediately, but I will respond. And you can also message me on Facebook and on um, YouTube or SoundCloud. And I will hope to see you again here next Sunday for the next um, main lesson for finishing this chapter. Namaste. Much love.